All right. Well, good morning, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants event. My name is Joe Grabowski, and I'll be your host for today. If you've been tuning in this month, you know one of our big themes is space exploration. We've been talking to scientists, engineers, even astronauts to learn more about how we explore outside of our planet, solar system, into the universe, but also how we look back down on our planet and can learn a lot uh, about who we are and develop new technologies. So do take some time and head over to exploringbytheseat.com where you'll find all the events we have coming up this month. It is a busy month with about 60 uh, or so live events for classrooms to join into. So today's event is gonna be a really special one. I wanna give a shout out to all the classrooms tuning in across Canada uh, and the United States. Do use the chat sidebar if you're on YouTube and let us know where you're tuning in from. We've already had classrooms in Alberta and Ontario uh, and California giving some shout outs. Uh, so let us know where you're tuning in from. Today we're joined by a uh, celebrated NASA astronaut, pilot, and space uh, of the Space Shuttle Endeavor, Terry Burtz. He was a crew member of the Russian Soyuz spacecraft, and he spent 200 consecutive days uh, in space as commander of the International Space Station. So this is one of the longest continuous space uh, missions of any NASA astronaut. He also did something pretty special. He helped install the station's 360 degrees cupola which not only helped him take a ton of pictures looking back down on our planet, but it gave him a deeper understanding of our planet's beauty, climate, and our place in the universe. So let's bring Terry in live with us now. Hey, Terry, how are you doing today? Hey, Joe, thanks for having me on, and hello to all the kids out there in North America. All right, well, it's always a pleasure to steal some of your time, Terry. We're thrilled to have you with us. I'm gonna let you take over for a little bit and share a little bit of your story. And then we'll have a, a Q and A session. I have a feeling it's going to be pretty busy. Amazing. Well, let me share my slides right here. And can you see those? <clears throat> yeah, looks good, Terry. Okay. Well, um, for everybody, I want to talk about uh, what it's like to go to space. So I'll talk you through a space mission that an astronaut flies. But the most important thing I want to do is have time for questions at the end. So there'll be some good um, Q and A time after I'm done talking about this. Uh, but the, every good space talk starts off with launch. And my first launch was on the Space Shuttle Endeavor. Um, it was in the winter time, it was in February, 2010, so a few years ago. And it was a really cold morning. I had been a fighter pilot and test pilot. I flew F-16s in the US Air Force. And uh, I thought I had done a lot. I thought I had you know, pulled Gs and been an afterburner, but there is nothing like a space shuttle launch. And this is a short video to show you a bit of what that's like. We were taking off at four in the morning and there were some clouds above us and when the rockets lit up those clouds, it was like nighttime turned into day. And in the shuttle, um, you go up to about three Gs of acceleration. So it's like laying on the ground on your back and having three of your best friends lay on top of you. It really smashes you down. You vibrate a lot. It's like having somebody grab you and shake you. And those rocket engines, the big white solid rocket motors, each burn 10,000 pounds a second. And the three smaller engines on the back of the shuttle each burn 1,000 pounds a second. So 23,000 pounds of fuel every second or 11,000 kilos, 11 tons every second. So there is a lot of fuel going out the back of the space shuttle. It does not get good gas mileage, um, but it's a pretty cool ride. It's about eight and a half minutes to get into orbit. And this is a long duration view. Um, this photo, it was taken by James Vernicatella. It's in my first National Geographic book called View From Above. And he just opened up the camera shutter and let it stay open during our flight into space. And you can see the moon in the distance. Um, you can see all the stars moving and that's how much the earth rotates in eight and a half minutes. Uh, if he did a 24 hour photo like this, you'd see the stars make a complete 360 because the earth goes all the way around. But launching into space was amazing. I got to do it again on a Russian Soyuz rocket about five years later. And that was a lot of fun. That was pretty cool. But my journey into space did not begin on the space shuttle launch pad. It started off when I was a little kid and I always wanted to be an astronaut. The first book I read was about Apollo. I grew up with uh, pictures of airplanes and rockets on my 
wall of my bedroom when I was a boy. It's just what I always wanted to do. And I was lucky because my parents supported me. They um, didn't do things for me, but they got me a computer and I had to teach myself how to program. And they got me a telescope and I had to teach myself how to find stars and constellation and how, how to align the telescope. Um, so they allowed me to do these things on my own. And when I was 13, I read a book called The Right Stuff. And it talked about how to be an astronaut, like how those early American astronauts got to do it was through being a fighter pilot and then test pilot and then astronaut. So that kind of paved the way for me. And I eventually ended up um, as an F-16 pilot at test pilot school. And as part of that, uh, everybody there wanted to be an astronaut. And NASA announced that they were going to have an astronaut class while I was a student. So I went ahead and applied and no one else applied. Um, they were, everybody was saying, well, you're too young. You don't have enough experience. You're not ready to go yet. And I just didn't really listen to them. I went ahead and applied anyway. And they all promised me that I was not going to get selected. But long story short, I ended up getting selected. And I learned a really important lesson there. And that is don't tell yourself no. Um, all of my crew, classmates told themselves no, and they ended up not getting selected. And so whatever your dream is, if you want to be an astronaut or if you want to be a doctor, or if you want to start a company, um, don't tell yourself no. You have, you have to figure out what you need to do. You can't just say you want to do something. You actually have to take the steps. And a lot of times that's hard work. But the most important part, the first step is don't tell yourself no. Um, so I ended up getting to be an astronaut. It took a long time to fly. I had to wait 10 years. It was really, for a lot of reasons, uh, the Columbia accident, NASA had too many astronauts, but Eventually, I ended up here um, on the International Space Station. And as Joe said, on the first flight, we got to install Node 3 and also the cupola, which is this really cool module. I'll show you some pictures here shortly. Um, and then on my second flight, I was there for 200 days. So I spent over seven months here. And this is a great project for your class. You guys can go online on websites or there's apps you can download that tell you when the space station is going to fly over. Like it flew over Houston last night. We could see it uh, at nighttime here. And um, when you see it, you're actually seeing the brightest thing in the night sky besides the moon. Um, and you're seeing sunlight reflect off of those big giant solar panels. They're bigger than that space station is bigger than a football field, bigger than an American football field or a European football field. It's a, uh, it's a, it's a very large spaceship. So it reflects the sunlight um, when it flies over. This is a little video about what it's like to be weightless, which is really cool. It's something that I, you can't experience on earth for more than a few seconds, you know, jumping off a diving board, but you have to learn how to move with your hands, which is really challenging. Not only move, but also rotate and spin at the right rate. Um, and you have to learn how to keep track of stuff. You can see on the wall, there's all that Velcro there. I just put a lens on some Velcro. Um, there's all those Ziploc bags of batteries and lenses. And I have pockets with tethers. So you just, or clips, you just have to have something to keep track of stuff. Because if you don't, it will float away immediately. So learning how to deal with weightlessness is a pretty interesting process. Exercise is really important. Um, and thank you to IMAX, by the way. I helped film an IMAX movie called A Beautiful Planet. And this is one of the clips they let me use from that. But the um, being weightless makes your bones and your muscles get weak. And so exercising on a treadmill and on a bike and on a weightlifting machine, and you can see that here, is really important. You see the treadmill bouncing around. That's because it's on something called a vibration isolation system, which means it doesn't just bang the space station. If that treadmill were fixed to the wall, we would actually rattle the station apart. It would break. This is my crewmate, Samantha, doing exercise. She's doing deadlifts on that big giant machine that's called A-RED. And again, you can see the whole machine is moving because um, you don't want to rattle the station apart. But by using that exercise equipment, I actually uh, didn't lose any bone density during 200 days in space, which is pretty amazing. Um, cutting your hair is really important for me and Anton, our Russian crewmate who, by the way, Anton is in space right now with a Russian actress and Russian director, <clears throat> but, um, I would cut the hair and then he would vacuum it up as it went floating off. And it was a really interesting process for, for guys. It's pretty easy, but for Samantha, I think I gave her the first ever true woman's hairdo. Most women, there's a lot of women that fly in space, but they all just let their hair grow out 
and put it in a ponytail, but Samantha wanted a proper haircut. So that was a very stressful thing to do in space. Sleeping in space is really cool. It's a, um, I get my sleeping bag and we have a little, I, I would just get in there and float loose. You know, I wouldn't be attached to anything. And that was really, really, really cool. Um, sleeping in space was one of the favorite things I did while I was in space. The, mis the mission of the space station is science. Uh, this is a glove box where you could do complicated or dangerous experiments that we didn't want to get loose and float free. Um, it was uh, very interesting. I, we did over 250 experiments. Anything that you can study on Earth, we had available in space, which is pretty cool. This is me doing a spacewalk. I had a GoPro camera. It was actually a Russian GoPro camera. They built a special box to keep it pressurized and keep it from getting too hot. And we, uh, I, I had a chance to do three spacewalks and I just had this GoPro and you can see kind of a GoPro selfie, but you can see all the equipment and tethers. Everything is attached and floating with these lines or tethers. And doing a spacewalk is a really hard job. That spacesuit is big and bulky. It's a couple hundred pounds, about 150 kilos. And it is a tough uh, physical exercise to get in the spacesuit and move around for all of those um, minutes or hours. It's about eight and a half, nine hours while you're outside. <laughs> I knew I was important when I finally had my own Lego. Uh, Samantha, her boyfriend, Lionel Farah, actually sent us all lego uh astronaut crew members with our name on the name tag for our christmas present so that was pretty thoughtful of him and i like sports so he gave me a lego football of mine <clears throat> this is what it's like to land in a soyuz it's a capsule that hits the ground in kazakhstan and you can see just how how violent it is it's definitely the shuttle was nice it was a nice airplane touchdown on a runway but not this <laughs> the Soyuz, when it hit, it rolled 360 degrees completely over. It was, uh, it was quite a landing. So this is me in the cupola. The cupola is on the bottom of the station. So in my mind, Earth is always up. But these are just some of the photos that I took from the cupola. Uh, like Joe said, I ended up taking a lot of pictures. I took over 319,000. And when I got back, NASA told me that was the most that any astronaut had ever taken. <clears throat> this is a Typhoon Mysac. It was uh, in the Pacific uh, about April, March and April of 2015. And it hit the Philippines. And it's a beautiful, incredible storm. But it was so powerful and so angry looking that I was really, really big. I saw 23 different tropical storms from space, and this was by far the most, um, the most impressive. Sand dunes from space are really cool. This is the Adrar province in Algeria near Morocco, and the Sahara Desert is just really orange and black. Um, I think these are the Atlas Mountains maybe, but it's, a, uh, it's an amazing thing to be able to look down and see uh, sand dunes when you're in space. I didn't expect that, but you can see them. This was amazing. Whenever I was over Af Central Africa or Central South America or the South Pacific at nighttime, these storms would start flashing and they're just incredible. These are thunderstorms at night. Um, and I love to go down to the cupola, turn all the lights off, let my eyes adjust and just float while I watch these storms going off. This is something I've never seen from Earth, but those in, of you in Canada, you might have seen this, or Alaska, you probably have seen this. This is the Northern Lights, and the Earth has a big magnetic field around it, and there's a North Magnetic Pole and a South Magnetic Pole, um, and electrons from the Sun get captured by our magnetic field, and then they get funneled down to the North Pole and South Pole, and when the electrons hit the atmosphere, they glow green and pink. And so this is what it looks like in the Northern Hemisphere. This was in December. So basically when it's nighttime in the North is when you can see it. So there's Ireland and the United Kingdom 
and you can see the ground so well because it was a full moon. So this is in the middle of the night, but the moonlight is lighting up Earth. And our eyes are designed to work in black and white at night, but you can still perceive that green color and you can see the river of plasma flowing. It's really cool. There's Denmark and Norway. You can see all the snow down there on Earth. Um, Stockholm and Helsinki and St. Petersburg and um, as we go over into the Baltics. But it, every night it was like this ghost would show up, this green ghost. And that's the city of Moscow down below, one of the brightest and most beautiful cities. The South Magnetic Pole, on the other hand, is a lot farther away from the South, the normal South Pole. And therefore, it was a lot closer to our orbit. So the northern lights were always far in the distance by the North Magnetic Pole, but the southern lights were really close to our orbit and we actually flew through them. I remember one night flying through this giant green and red cloud. It was like being in a Star Trek movie with clouds of plasma. It was really amazing. <clears throat> and again, thank you to the IMAX company. This is a scene from a beautiful planet. Uh, they, they have some really cool software that can process the images and make them look amazing. But the southern lights are amazing. It's this river of flowing plasma. It goes way above our orbit on the space station. And uh, you can see the, the stars rising as the Earth rotates and as we fly around the Earth. But it's a seeing the northern and southern lights is really cool. Um, this is a moon set. I took probably 100 of these time lapses. Um, Every one is different. But this is the moon go setting behind our atmosphere off to the side of the station. So you can ask your teachers about physics and light refraction, um, the difference between refraction and reflection and why it changed color too. So imagine when you look looking out at these stars at night, you turn all the lights off, you close your eyes, you let your eyes adjust and get um, your night vision. And then you look out and you see this. Again, thank you to IMAX for, I, I shot this scene and they, they processed it. Um, you can see the moon shining off the ocean on the bottom left. The blue atmosphere you see during the day looks brown at night, and it's also a lot thicker at night. You can see that there's really, really thin atmosphere that goes up pretty high above Earth. Um, and then that's the center of the galaxy. There's so many billions of stars I could never see constellations. I could see the planets between Mercury and Neptune, but I could never see pick out any constellations because there are just so many stars out there. <clears throat> This is really cool. This is the Bahamas. Um, and these are sand dunes also, just like in Africa, except for they're sand dunes underwater. Um, they're made by water and not air. And this blue, green, turquoise area is huge. It takes up a really big part of Earth. Um, and it's really pretty. This is my favorite picture. This is the last picture I took in space. And I think it's the favorite picture that I took um just an amazing wide angle fisheye lens of of the sun starburst over our planet and you can really see that thin blue line and everybody who's ever been every human being who's ever existed is from below that blue line our atmosphere and above it there's not any humans that have ever you know been born or lived other than a few people in a spaceship uh, so there's really only one planet that we have and that's earth and there's a couple pictures that I that I took um, that can show some of the environmental problems. For the most part, it's a beautiful planet. It really is spectacular. Uh, but this is a picture over China, over northeastern China. And there's just a lot of pollution there um, because of the coal and the gas that they're burning. And you could see this big brown smog down there. You could also see it over India. But this part of China was definitely the worst place on Earth. And... This is the Amazon. Normally it's covered in clouds, but uh, on this particular day it opened up and you can see it should be all dark green, but all the really light green areas are where they've cut down trees for the logs. And this is called deforestation. Um, and this is a really bad idea. We should not be cutting down the Amazon <laughs> for trees. There's lots of other places on earth um, in America, there's lots of places. In Canada, there's lots and lots of places that you can do foresting and you can get trees sustainably and you cut down some, you plant some new ones and you can do that forever. They can regenerate themselves. But when you do this in places like a rainforest in the Amazon, 
you can't get it back. And it's a really bad idea for what they're doing down there. So those are just a couple of the things that I could see from space, some of the environmental issues. Um, and I've, I've written a couple books. I've done a couple films about my time in space. It's a really cool subject. And uh, I think with that, what I'd like to do is some Q&A, Joe, if we're ready for that. All right, Terry, absolutely. Well, first of all, thank you so much for taking us uh, out of the atmosphere and, and sharing some of your experience and stuff. That was great. Uh, and, you know, I'm really glad you included those images at the end. Um, I think it's a real kind of wake-up call that even from space, we can see how we're changing the planet. Um, yeah. We've only got one of them. So, um, yeah, it's definitely a perspective everyone kind of needs to see is, you know, we think the Earth is huge. Uh, until you're looking down and you realize it's this little spaceship almost moving through the universe. It is spaceship Earth, and there's no there's no Plan B, right? There's only Earth. We're not ever going to have another planet that we can live on. So um, it would be cool to go to Mars and explore, but we'll always be in a spaceship, and yeah, you know, there won't be a millions of people going to Mars. So we, you know, Earth is Earth is our home, and it's good. I think a lot of people are aware of it, and a lot of people are taking care of it, which is really good. All right. We've got a great group of classrooms with us right now. We're going to start meeting them right away. Uh, I do want to tell the classrooms as well. Uh, we're probably going to wrap up around 145 Eastern, uh, but stick with me for a few extra minutes. I made a little Kahoot quiz uh, that the classrooms, the students can do with me uh, after Terry has to leave. So we'll wrap up with that little quiz uh, after the Q&A. So Terry, let's jump right into it. Um, let's see. Let's start off. We're going to head to... Let's go to uh, Miss Fairweather's crew. They're joining us in Victoria, British Columbia. I'm going to pop them in right now. There they are. How are we doing, BC? <laughs> All right, who's got a question? How do you go to the bathroom in space? <laughs> well, the most important thing is very carefully. Um, the, there's a couple basic things to know. First of all, airflow is how you make sure everything goes in the right direction. So on Earth, you have gravity, which is pretty nice. In space, you have fans that blow air and that keeps everything moving um, in the right direction. Uh, and then there's a toilet for, there's like a hose for number one and a can with a hole in it for number two. And uh, everything works good. Actually, it works really well, but you wanna really understand how the toilet works because you don't want to be the guy that breaks it. <laughs> so I was always very careful. There's a checklist you have to run when you go to make sure you turn the switch on and open the hose and whatever at the right time. So I always followed the checklist to make sure I didn't break that thing because that would have been really embarrassing. <laughs> All right. Well, I had a feeling that question would come up today. Students, whether we're talking to an ocean rower or an astronaut, they always want to know, how do you get the business done? So uh, good get it stuff. Out of the way early. Yeah. So building on that question, Ms. Wilbanks, fifth graders, they're joining us via YouTube. They want to know, what does space smell like? Did the space station have a smell? What, what was that like? Yeah. You know, I had that same question. I was wondering, like, if I get there, is it going to be gross or whatever? And the answer is not really. It just smelled like plastic and metal and wires and computers and stuff, you know, uh, the kind of gear you'd expect there to be in a space station. Um, if you exercise, which I did every day for two and a half hours in an Under Armour t-shirt, the Under Armour is just the brand that we had. Uh, those things get pretty nasty after about a day or two. We had a special, um, Merino wool t-shirt. It was an experiment. It's a special kind of wool from New Zealand and Australia. And, um, I wore a t-shirt made out of that for a month. Every day for a month, I got drenching sweat. And that t-shirt never smelled bad. It was amazing. They're doing a payload to see if, if we can just send astronauts less clothes because it's so expensive to send stuff into space. Um, and like you can buy that stuff on Earth. I, I actually wear it for a podcast I do called Down to Earth with Terry Verts. And it's designed for like if you're traveling um, so you don't have to pack a lot of clothes, you can get merino wool. If you're camping for a week or two and you don't want to pack stuff, you, you bring your merino wool. So that was one of the smells that I didn't have to deal with. And the other one was um, like apples and oranges. When a, when a new uh, spaceship would come up, a cargo ship, they would usually put that stuff in. And, and um, 
it worked pretty well. So that like that smell was amazing. My, my favorite thing about uh, the new cargo ships was smelling oranges. We would all pass around the oranges and just smell them, even though they and they were basically rotten. We didn't eat them. They were gross, but they smelled really good. So everybody smelled them and then we put them in a Ziploc and duct taped them and threw them away. Okay. All right. Great question. Uh, we're going to jump over to Alaska now. Miss Carton, sixth graders are hanging out with us. Let's bring them in. How are we doing, Alaska? Doing pretty good. All right. Who's got All a question right. for us? Go ahead, ask a question. Have you guys ever seen any UFOs up in space? The, uh, the second most popular question. Hey, where in Alaska are you from? Anchorage. Anchorage. I did two really important NASA training classes there. Uh, we went down to Whittier and paddled in Prince William Sound for a couple weeks as a, like a survival training preparation for an expedition. And that was one of the most beautiful places on earth. That part of Alaska is amazing. So I have not seen UFOs. It's funny. I told you about my podcast down to earth. I've had a couple of UFO guests on there and those are by far the most popular podcasts. Like tens of thousands of people listen to those episodes. Um, the, my thought on aliens is there's a lot of planets out there. So you'd think there would be life out in the universe. Uh, there's so many billions of planets, but I also think life is really complicated and I don't think it just happens randomly. I think somebody needs to make it because it's just even one simple cell is so complex just from a scientific point of view, not even from a religious point of view, I say that. Um, and even if they were out there, they're so far away, you know, light years are a long way and hundreds of light years are really, really long way. And millions of light years are really, 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 really far away. Um, so I don't know that you'd think that they're out there, but they're a long way if they are. So I'm not sure, but I never saw any myself. All right. Well, we're going to jump to Xavier, who's joining us with his class in North Hollywood. Uh, and he's curious about the fuel for the space shuttle. How much fuel did it take uh, to break the hold of gravity and get up into orbit? That's a great question, Xavier. And by the way, I miss Hollywood so much. I was out there a bunch the last couple of years making a movie called One More Orbit. And then I haven't been out there since COVID hit. So I need to get back out there. I miss it. Miss In-N-Out Burger. Um, the space shuttle had about 4 million pounds of rocket fuel. Um, more than half of rockets are made out of fuel. And so, and this is chemical fuel. So you take a fuel and an oxidizer and you burn it and that makes the gas really hot and it shoots out the back end of the rocket and nozzle. And the speed that you can go forward is depends on the speed that you can push the exhaust out the back. And with chemical rockets, the most efficient rocket uses hydrogen and oxygen, and that makes water. Actually, the space shuttle used that. So our exhaust from the three main engines was water. That was the, the exhaust that we made. Um, but that's as fast as you can go. It, there are other types of rockets called electric propulsion or nuclear thermal um, that you can actually shoot the propellant out a lot faster, and you can go a lot faster. So using chemical rockets, it would take between six and nine months to get to Mars. And then you have to wait a year and a half while the planets go around the sun before they line up to come back another six to nine months. So a chemical rocket is about three year trip back and forth to Mars. If you use electric propulsion where you shoot hydrogen or xenon or um, helium, something out the back, you can go a lot faster and you can get to Mars and back in about one year. So instead of three years for chemical rockets, electric propulsion could do one year, which is why I think that's the most important technology that we need to be working on to get to Mars. All right, another great question from our crew uh, in Hollywood. I'm gonna bring in Miss Burns class joining us in Ontario, Canada, sixth graders. How are we doing everyone? Okay. All right, who's got a question for us? The longest mission I was on was about 200 days. It was supposed to be 169 days when we launched. <clears throat> and then we lost 
an orbital Cygnus cargo ship, and then we lost a Russian Progress cargo ship, and then we lost a SpaceX Dragon cargo ship, three of them back to back to back in eight months. So it was a bad time to be a mission planner for the ISS having to trying to plan out supplies because our cargo ships kept on blowing up. But when the Russian Progress blew up, we had to wait to launch the Soyuz with the crew on board because they use the same rocket. It's a slightly different capsule, but basically the same rocket. And they didn't want to launch humans until they figured out what caused the cargo ship to blow up. And they didn't want to bring us back to Earth until our replacements could come up. And so they said, hey, you're stuck in space. And we didn't know how long it was going to be. We were low on supplies. In a lot of ways, it was like being stuck in COVID last year. So I actually wrote a short book about it. And I did some videos about what it was like to be stuck in space and what it was like to be stuck on Earth. But it ended up being about a month extension. And so it went from 169 to two, 200. It, it was either 201 days or 199 and three quarter days. If Monday through Friday is five days, then we spent 201 days in space. And if you hit your stopwatch, start and stop, then we spent 199 and three quarters. Okay. We're going to head over to Pennsylvania now. We've got some fifth graders hanging out with Mr. Jervin. Let's bring them in. Hey, fifth graders, how are we doing? Good. All right. Who's that? Question for you. When, um, when you go into space, you ever not do you? Hmm. Can you try that one more time? The signal is breaking up on us. We might have to type it in the chat. Okay, I'll try one where, more time. Where in Pennsylvania are you guys from? Uh, Lancaster. Lancaster, very good. I used to spend my summers in York when I was a boy. All right, try that question one more time. It just kind of breaks up on us right in the middle and we miss it. Oh, I think I see it. Coming. Never get sick. You forget yeah, like so I got sick on my first flight. I think mo everybody feels bad in some, in some way or another. My, my problem was I had a really bad headache for about two days. Um, real quick, your, your brain, your balance system has three parts. One is vision. If you look and you can see the walls and you can see up and down, that sends a signal to your brain about which way is up and which way is down. Uh, the other one is called somatosensory. So I can feel me sitting on the chair and my brain knows where gravity is. So if, if I can feel the chair down there, I know that gravity is down there. And then the third one, um, the, this neurovestibular system is called the otolith system or semicircular canals. So you have three circle, circles in three different directions in your ear that can tell if you're rotating, which is really interesting because that's exactly how the space shuttle is designed and F-16s are designed. A lot of airplanes have the same three axis rate gyro system and our brains have the same thing in it. And that you can close your eyes and you can still feel which way is up and down and you can still tell that you're moving even if your eyes are closed. So in space, your, your vision is telling you that up is one way you don't have any somatosensory. You can't feel your butt sitting in a chair because there's no weight anywhere. And your semicircular canals are completely confused because the fluid is floating in there and they have no idea which way is up or down or when you're pitching your head. So your brain gets all these three different confusing signals sent to it and it, it just is confused. And I had the worst headache. I could only move my head about this fast for about the first two days. If I moved any faster than that, I would have gotten sick. So I didn't move it any faster than that. And it was kind of miserable. And then all of a sudden on the third morning, it was like a light switch. All of a sudden, boom, I was better. And then I was better for the rest of that two-week mission. And then five years later, when I went back on the Soyuz, I was fine from day one. Like I never had any problems. Um, except the other problem I had is that you grow you know, on Earth, gravity pushes you down. And when the gravity goes away, you grow about two inches. And so I um, had a pretty bad back problem. And my back hurt just from my spine extending. And that went on for a couple of weeks. Um, but there's a lot of different medical issues that people have that are pretty interesting. 
All right, let's jump to our next classroom here. We need to go to Miss Stevens' class. Let's bring them in here. Hey, everyone, how are we doing? Good. Good. All right, Miss Stevens' class is joining us in Hamilton. Who's got a question for us? How many orbits did you do in space? How many orbits did I do in space? So you go around the planet about 16 times a day and I spent a little over 200 days in space. Or, so I think, and you can look on NASA, they'll, they'll tell you exactly how many, but it was like 3,300 or 3,400 orbits of the planet. So I went, went around the earth a few times. I've gone around the earth a few times in airplanes, but not nearly as fast as I did on the space station. All right, great question. Uh, Miss Johnson's class, let's bring them in here. Miss Johnson's class, how are we doing today? Good. Good. So they're, hi, grade six, sevens in Listwell, Ontario. Yes, okay, come on up. <clears throat> All right. What's your favorite space food? My favorite space food, that's a good question. I liked a lot of it. There was a good variety of it. Um, I got some Russian food as part of my food and they have really good um, borscht, which is a uh, Russian soup. Uh, mashed potatoes are really good. They had great fish. NASA didn't have any fish. And so it was really nice to have um, some fish from the Russians. For NASA, I love the, the chocolate pudding cake. That was good. <laughs> uh, shrimp cocktail, I think is every astronaut's favorite because it's this really spicy shrimp that, that tastes good. And, in space, you, your face gets puffy and all the fluid floats up there. So um, you, you just didn't taste as much. And that was really good. Um, the beef brisket was good. Uh, and I loved vegetables too. Cauliflower and cheese, that was good. So I, there, I liked a lot of it, but probably the ch chocolate cake and, and shrimp cocktail. All right. I'm glad that question came up. We were having a lot of those questions coming in via YouTube as well. Curious about the food. Uh, Mrs. Eads, fifth and sixth graders in Waterloo. Let's bring them in for a question. Say hi. Hi, hey, everyone. Hey. Claire, ask. Um, do you get hot when you're in the astronaut suit? Do you get cold when you're in the astronaut suit? No, hot. Hot. Oh, hot. Okay. Well, we'll talk about cold and hot. So the suits have um, uh, protection for both. Hot is the biggest problem, like you said. That's a very smart question because the sun is super hot and it's a it's a completely closed suit. So you, you guys are, a lot of you are in Canada or Alaska. You know what it's like to be in a snowsuit and... Um, if you do exercise, if you move around in it, you start sweating and that's really bad. And it's the same thing in a spacesuit. So we have this long underwear that has plastic tubes in, in the long underwear and cold water goes through that. And that really cools you down. That's for launch and landing. Um, in the space shuttle suit, we had that. It's also for uh, doing sp space walking. Um, it's it's a good uh, it's a good thing, and um, besides be getting too hot, you can actually get too cold. And the NASA engineers told me when I was on my spacewalk that there would be this one place that I would get cold and this one place that I would get hot, and uh, they were right about both. Um, when it was I was getting cold, I was in the shade, I was in a really dark part of the station, and all of a sudden I just started like getting really cold. And they have some glove heaters you can warm up your fingers with. And I was about to turn them on, but I could see the sun was about to come up. So I just waited a minute. And as soon as the sun popped above the horizon, I immediately warmed up, like immediately. It was amazing how quickly uh, the sun can warm you up. And then there was this other place uh, where they said, you're going to feel hot. And all of a sudden, I just started feeling like prickly and tingly, like somebody was jabbing me with needles. And the they were right. It was right in this one area when all of a sudden I got hot. So uh, the spacesuits have a lot of effort and equipment to try and keep you cold. But the biggest thing is that long underwear with the water um, flowing that keeps you cool. 
Okay. So Mrs. Barry's class is joining us on YouTube and you mentioned sleeping, how you enjoyed the experience of sleeping in space. Did you find you dreamt differently, more or less? Any difference <laughs> did you notice? That's a great question. So I showed that picture of me in the sleeping bag. I would put on some headsets. I had some Bose headsets and plug them into my laptop. And I listened to Interstellar, the, the movie Interstellar soundtrack. I listened to that for about a month. It was great to fall asleep to that. Um, another month, I, the Russians sent up sounds from Earth. So they sent up rain and jungle sounds and waves lapping at the ocean and a crowded cafe. I, I'll never forget these sounds. And um, we, <laughs> while I listened to those, the sound of rain for about a month, um, I actually dreamt of earth, which was bizarre because I had been having dreams of just blackness and black asteroids and just darkness of space. And then as soon as I started listening to rain, um, I started dreaming of earth and these green fields. I remember a rolling hills and green fields and a house. I still remember what that looked like. So um, dreams were really cool. All right. And a final question. Uh, from our class in BC, there's someone who's been waiting at the camera for a while, so I'm going to let them squeeze one in. Um, can you see any exoplanets from the International Space Station? Exoplanets. So you can't see the exoplanets. Those things are light years away. Um, and the, the way we see those planets is by what's called occultation. So there's a star, and when the planet moves in... Here, use this. When the planet moves in front of the star, it makes it a little bit dimmer. And just by noticing how things dim, you can tell how big the planet is and what the period is. So how long it takes for it to go around um, the star. And you can tell by the light reflecting from the star as it passes through the planet's atmosphere, you can sort of tell what kind of chemicals are in the planet's atmosphere, which is really cool. Um, but they're so far away, you can't see them. The planets I could see, like I said, was Mercury all the way through Neptune, or I'm sorry, all the way through Saturn, uh, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto and beyond, or you can't see those with your naked eye, but I could see out the Saturn. The really interesting planet I saw was Mercury. I think very few humans have ever seen Mercury and known what they were looking at. If you have trees or buildings, you won't be able to see it because it's always just right there on the horizon, um, right next to the sun. But from space, I could see it a lot. And that was that was actually pretty cool. All right. Well, first of all, classrooms don't go anywhere because we're gonna wrap up with uh, a Kahoot quiz. So get uh, your devices ready and I will put the quiz up shortly. But Terry, I wanna say a huge thank you. Thank you so much for hanging out with us today uh, and all of the classrooms. Thanks for answering the questions for us and those amazing images. Uh, and it's always a pleasure to catch up uh, and hear what you've been up to. So thanks so much, Terry. Yeah, it was great talking to you, Joe, and good to see you kids. Hopefully you're having fun in school and things are getting back to normal. And I am off to <laughs> see the Astros play. They, they got a playoff game in 20 minutes, so I got to run to the stadium. <laughs> All right. Well, here's a few of the classrooms. I'll pop a few in if they want to do a quick goodbye and thank you. Thanks so much, Terry. Thanks, classrooms. Don't go anywhere. We're going to have our quiz, uh, our interactive yes. game. Thanks, Terry. Bye-bye. <laughs> All right. See you later, Terry. Thank you. Okay. So, like I said, we're going to wrap up with a little Kahoot. We'll see how well you were paying attention uh, with Terry today. I'm going to pop the banner up right here. If you go to kahoot.it, you can find uh, the, the pin page. I'm gonna put the pin up on the screen. If you're tuning in with us and you have a device at your desk or computer, you can use it right there. If you don't have devices for everyone, well, your teacher can pop it up on the main screen uh, and you can shout out the answer for your teacher. So let's get my screen shared here really quickly and let's wrap up with this Kahoot today. Um, there we go. So four questions. The pin number is going to pop up right now. Let's see what it's going to be for today. Today's pin number is going to be 2714683. So we'll give a few seconds here for some students uh, to come in and join us for our Kahoot quiz today. Here come some students. Uh, we've been doing this in September. It's a lot of fun. 20 seconds for each question. The right answer, of course, you're going to get some points. 
but the quicker you can put that right answer in, the more points you're gonna get. If you get the wrong answer and you're fast, well, you still get nothing because the right answer is pretty darn important. So lots of students joining, that's great. We'll give another few more seconds and then we'll see who comes out on top, who's paying the most attention uh, during Terry's talk today. Great to connect with Terry. Uh, pretty amazing to have spent over 200 days on one mission uh, on the space station to launch via the space shuttle uh, and then to return to Earth on one of the Russian capsules, the Soyuz capsule. That's pretty awesome. All right, over 160 students and still a few more trickling in. Uh, maybe 10 more seconds and then we'll start the quiz. All right, here we go. First question coming up, 20 seconds each question. The quicker you get the right answer, the more points you're going to end up with. So here we go. Question one, how many days was Terry in space commanding the space station? Was it 50 days, 100 days, 200 days, or was it 250 days? How many days was Terry in command of uh, the International Space Station? All right, well over 100 students went with 200 days. Uh, we know Terry said, depending on how you set your watch, it could have been 199 and three quarters uh, or just hitting 201, but so 200 days uh, on the space station. Well, there we go. Colin using his big brain is in first place. Let's go to our next question. Question two, how many G's of acceleration are felt during a launch? So gravity pushing down on you. Was it three G's, four G's, five G's or eight G's? How many, how much force of gravity, how many times the force of gravity was pushing down during a space shuttle launch? Three, four, five, or eight? All right, a little tricky that question, but Terry said it was three G. So picture laying on the ground and three of your friends laying on top of you. That's how much force, how much pressure was pushing down uh, on the astronauts during the space shuttle launch. All right. Colin's still in the lead. Let's jump to our next question. Question three, exercise is important in space. To sleep well, to keep your muscles and bones healthy, to look good when you land, or it's a trick question, exercise is not important in space. So why was exercise important in space? To sleep well, keep your muscles and bones healthy, look good, or is it a trick question? All right, great question. Because gravity is not pushing down on you, uh, your muscles and your bones will slowly start to break down. Atrophy is the fancy word for that. Um, so astronauts have to work out sometimes up to two hours or more a day. And pretty cool, Terry mentioned that his bone density didn't change uh, from the time he left Earth to the time he came back. That's pretty rare. Last question, anything can happen on the last question. Colin's still in the lead, uh, but not by much. So let's see what happens. Question four, what is the main mission of the space station? Was it science? Is it making movies? Is it watching the earth? Or is it testing technology? What was the main mission, did Terry say, of the space station? Science, making movies, watching the earth, or testing technology? All right, most went with science, which is right. Uh, at any given time, there's Lots of different science experiments going on in the space station. Different astronauts are in charge of different experiments. Um, and they can range from all kinds of things to testing how tomatoes grow in space, uh, to looking at how cells change. Uh, very cool. Uh, and I put making movies there because right now, Terry mentioned one of his colleagues is on the space station, a Russian cosmonaut uh, and an actress. And they're filming the first movie ever uh, in space right now. So not what the space station's for, but that's currently happening on the space station. Let's see how things wrap up. Third place, Willy Walnuts, good job. Second, Ernie. And first place. All right, Big Brain Colin was able to hold all four questions. Great job, everyone, and thanks for playing Kahoot with us today. Let me come back from that screen share. All right. Well, 
Uh, a huge shout out to all of our camera classrooms who joined us today and sending us in those great questions. A huge shout out to all the YouTube classrooms for joining us uh, and typing in those awesome questions. Thank you so much. We've got lots of space events coming up um, with engineers and scientists from NASA uh, working at places like Goddard Space, State, or Space Center, Johnson Space Center, um, where else? Uh, Ames uh, as well. So lots of great events still to come. Uh, thank you everyone for tuning in and hanging out with Terry today. And I hope you have a great uh, weekend, long weekend for those in Canada and hopefully a great weekend for those in the US. Thanks everyone. We'll see you next time.